Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Zaburski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the, the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Michelle. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes, glad to be here with you today. My name is Michelle Marshall. I'm the head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Puma North America, um, where I oversee all the DNI strategy and planning for um, Puma North America, as well as oversee our um, social justice platform. And you've been observing how organizations have been pursuing diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. What have you been seeing them doing right, and what have you been seeing them doing wrong? Well, every organization is different on their journey. So in terms of the things that organizations are getting right, I think any organization that's engaging with their employees and making sure they have a voice um, in the planning and building of their strategies is always the right start because um, they're the ones who's experiencing the things that's going on in the culture. And it's always good to engage employees. And it's always good to just hear what your consumers are saying as well, because there are very key stakeholders externally that we should definitely be listening to and leveraging um, those insights from to make sure we're putting our best foot forward as an organization. In terms of what organizations are getting wrong, I can't say if an organization is getting it wrong, because like I said, everyone is different on their journey. But one thing I think organizations need to be conscious of is if they're going to um, concentrate on increasing representation, mm -hmm. ensure that you have set the right tone in your culture first, okay. because you can hire all the diverse talent um, you want to hire, but if they're coming into a culture that is not welcoming, if they're mm -hmm. coming into a culture where there's no community set for them, um, then you're going to hear have um, you're going to see the rotating door when it comes to retention. It's going to be very difficult um, to retain those employees. The other thing I think there are some opportunities for organization is um, just be more consistent with your, your messaging and your communication hmm. on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Make sure that employees know what your commitment are, your commitment hmm. is, and stay hold, stay hold true to those commitments. And make sure they're getting timely updates about all the things that you're working on in order to ensure that you're moving the needle forward. And then the last thing I would mention is the other opportunity for organization is organizations is make sure you're holding your leaders accountable mm -hmm. and actually putting metrics in place. It's one thing to say we have a DNI strategy in place, um, but it's another thing if you're really coming up with a comprehensive plan um, and measuring what you're doing. The old saying goes, if it's not being measured, it's, it's not being done. So mm -hmm. you want to ensure that you're um, applying um, some ROI and, and measurements to the work that you're doing. I think what, the, I'm sorry, let me back up. The saying is actually what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So <laughs> if it's not being measured, then uh, um, chances are it's not really moving forward in the right way. That makes sense. Now, I want to touch on the issue of leadership because what I often see in helping clients figure out their future work strategies and including their stakeholder inclusion is that the top level leadership is not getting measured on diversity, equity, and inclusion criteria. And so what are your thoughts about this measurement in terms of not simply about the organization, but about the top level leadership and the managers, to what extent shouldn't, if so, how should they be measured on diversity, equity, and inclusion criteria? Well, uh, that's a great question. That just depends on what, what, how far along the organization is in their journey. But mm -hmm. if you think about any business at the beginning of their year, just right now, like for example, everyone is planning their goals and objectives for 2024. Mm -hmm. And that is with any business. So they should be doing the same thing with their goals around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because oftentimes leaders, they have so many things they have to focus on and of course, they're focused on the objectives and the goals that they are being held accountable for from their senior leaders and from their board of directors. So it's the same thing with the ENI. As we go into our years, year over year, it's important to really um, drive home to senior leaders 
that these are our, our big rocks and the things we really want to focus on from a DNI standpoint for the following year, just to keep them accountable so you can measure that and continuously ensure that they are reporting out on what they're doing in relation to the objective that has been set. Hmm. Now, when we're thinking about measuring, what kind of, so you have measurement, but you need some kind of accountability. What are the right kinds of accountability for leaders to make sure that DI objectives are met? What do you do when they don't meet these objectives? How important should they be? How do you think about this issue? So when it comes to DNI goals, you definitely have to be careful. You want to make sure that they're they're legal and you're not giving quotas. So mm -hmm. when I talk about measurements, I talk about things like how do we bring leaders along when it comes to engagement from a, a DNI um, events and um, standpoint? Mm -hmm. Are they actively participating in employee resource group events? Mm -hmm. Are they attending those events? Are they members of employee resource group events? Since they're a senior leader, if there's an opportunity, are they signing up to become an executive sponsor to be an active leader and advisor to the employee resource groups? When you talk about things like leadership and development, um, are they actively participating in those trainings um, around um, DNI when it comes to unconscious bias and microaggressions? For example, um, we rolled out, Puma rolled out an inclusive leadership track this year, which was a six part series um, with different engagements and, uh, and training, specifically speaking to leaders on how do you become a more inclusive leader? Um, and how, and if you're going to become a more inclusive leader, what is the language and the behaviors you should be displaying to ensure that you're building a culture that is psychologically safe for your employees and also um, ensuring that they have a sense of belonging as they come to work every day? Mm. Now, I'm curious. So we have a, we've talked about a number of things. You haven't mentioned mentoring and sponsorship yet. And I want to talk a little bit about that because when I established mentoring and sponsorship programs in companies and I helped them figure that out, I really focused specifically on minority groups, on underrepresented voices, because a big challenge for people who belong to underrepresented groups is a lack of mentorship and sponsorship from senior folks. So I'm curious, how do you address that gap in mentorship and sponsorship for people from underrepresented groups? For sure. So typically when you look at the research, um, diverse groups are usually over mentored and under sponsored. And just for the difference in that, oftentimes you can easily get a mentor or someone to give you guidance around your career. But those sponsors are those leaders that are saying your names and rooms that you're not in. Yeah. It's, um advocating for you for big projects, just advocating for you for promotions. Uh -huh. um, so from a standpoint of addressing those things to ensure that more diverse talent is um, getting those, those sponsors, is just ensuring that when we are putting development programs in place and have those leadership opportunities, that we're really being intentional with working, for example, with the employee resource groups and aligning their leaders um, um, with those um, development programs that we're already putting in place to ensure that we have diverse representation and that those employees are able to um, be um, leading leading projects that will be um, organizational wide projects so they can get in front of those leaders and build mm -hmm. relationship with lead senior leaders so they will increase the chances of them um, gaining a sponsor from those projects and those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other piece of that is just being very intentional about figuring out ways to put senior leaders in front of employees, um, um, making sure they're able to have those conversations. I know this is something we're early on and haven't rolled out yet, but figuring out how to have more listening sessions mm -hmm. and skip level meetings so leaders can hear from um, employees across the organizations and not just their direct reports. Mm -hmm. So how do you, so you started the conversation by saying it's important to get information from underrepresented groups to the organization about what's going on with them. What are some best practices for actually getting this information and sharing it both with the leadership team, but also the middle management? Yes, one, um, some of the best practices are, of course, having those focus groups from time to time, ensuring you're having those listening sessions 
with different populations of employees to just see um, what their sentiments are of what how things are going across the organization. Um, the other piece of that is something that we're embarking upon launching this year for the first time is a belonging survey to specifically focus on um, capturing sentiment of employees so we can know how we're doing from a DNI standpoint. Um, we may think we're doing a great job and we have all the great events and initiatives in place, but employees are going to really tell us what is what they feel and we want to know what they feel and where we should be investing more resources to ensure mm -hmm. that we're truly doing what we need to do to ensure that employees have the support that they need. Hmm. Well, one thing I haven't heard you mention, and I've, I've seen this done elsewhere, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, is particularly doing both stay interviews and exit interviews with members of underrepresented groups. So exit interviews are sometimes done, but really focusing on uh, listening to their voices as they're exiting because they might be more frank, and also stay interviews. So interviews where managers talk with their employees about their career goals and what they can do to support their career goals with the intention of retaining these employees and making sure that these employees see a long-term career in the organization. I'm curious about your perspective on both those types of, of interviews. Yes, for sure. So in terms of exit interviews, I actually had a, a meeting this morning and discussed um, what we probably, what we are working on building out our questions in terms, because we have, we have DNI questions incorporated into our exit interviews, mm -hmm. but we can, those questions can be more robust because as talent leave, usually that's the only time we're capturing their sentiment and the experiences that they had. Um, you, I mentioned the inclusive leadership track earlier. Our last, um, session that we had was on state interviews because the goal is for us to roll that out in the future so we can have those conversations and we can ensure that we know what's happening with employees before they exit um, so we can find ways to retain them, find ways to better support them and make sure they understand because oftentimes we take for granted that employees know all the great things and the development opportunities that the organization is doing, but sometimes they don't know. Um, and so time, sometimes it's just as simple as having a conversation about the resources that's available and the development opportunities that employees can tap into. So yes, exit and stay interviews. Exit interviews is something that we're um, currently doing and stay interviews are um, something that we're working to incorporate in the very near future because we want to ensure that we're capturing the employee sentiment in real time and not waiting when they leave the organization. Excellent. And as we finish up, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're excited about Puma doing in this area in the next couple of years? In terms of the... DI programs in general. For sure, for sure. Um, really excited because I, I, I don't know if you know this, I was Puma's first diversity leader and hmm. just watching us build from the ground up over the past two, almost three years has been a, um, definitely been a great journey. Um, uh, uh, just the things that we've done in our culture from such a short amount of time um, in terms of how we've went from one ERG to now having five um, four employee resource groups in the diversity council um, in terms of how we're showing up from the standpoint of being intentional about our leadership and development programs, figuring out how we can better support our employees. Um, even the things we're doing in the community from a, a being intentional about how we're investing in the community, making sure we're part of them, supporting marginalized groups, ensuring that we're rolling out um, programming and, and, and um, supporting the community where we can measure the impact year over year. Um, one of the things that we recently rolled out that was, I'm really excited about is we rolled out a partnership with um, Clark Atlanta University, which is a HBCU. And the reason for that is because um, we're really focused on increasing the representation just across the entire organization and all of our functions. So we intentionally partnered with um, Clark Atlanta to ensure that we can expose and build um, ex access and awareness with um, the art and fashion and the business students around all the exciting roles in our, our industry. Oftentimes students, when they're coming up, they don't get all this information that they can now, they can work in fashion or a sneaker industry or the music industry or entertainment industry. They sometimes think those things are far removed or they have to move to New York to work in those roles mm -hmm. or 
somewhere like Paris or LA. So we really want to talk, talk, um, make sure they know about all those great opportunities to work within our industry. And we're being really intentional about how we show up from a standpoint of um, how we're pipelining for diverse talent and the programs we're rolling out. So we're engaging with members of the diverse organizations that we partner with year round. Um, the other thing I'm really excited about is just the things that we're doing to ensure that we're being organic and authentic when it comes to our marketplace, um, how we're being intentional when it comes to um, our product line releases and our marketing campaigns. One thing that we did in recent years, we have a group of employees, um, Black employees who came together and they wanted to start um, telling their own stories versus huh. um, the organization um, coming up with the Black History Month stories. Huh. So this group, We Are Legends, came together. And so we really work with that group and they they tell different stories around um, Black culture year over year. And more than that, um, when the group came together, they said, we want to also make sure we're activating the next generation of talent. So they're really, we're really leveraging that group to help um, mentor and provide career prep um, to the next generation of diverse talent as well. Um, and then just some of the other things that we're doing, we're just continuously looking at our processes and ensuring that we're removing biases from our various mm -hmm. processes We've always done for the last few years, we've ensured that we had a process in pay, place to ensure pay equity, to make sure that we're auditing and, and making sure that um, we're, we're being fair when it comes to pay when it, from a race and gender standpoint. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm really loving is that we're becoming more data driven, just making sure that we're always staying on top of ensuring that we know the data when it comes to representation uh, when it comes to new hires and promotion, that we're collecting more data when it comes to our customer segments and ensuring that we're being really intentional about how can we um, better connect with our diverse audiences. And from the standpoint and internally, how can we not only recruit, but also retain diverse talent? Excellent. This sounds really exciting. Thank you for, so much for sharing your expertise, Michelle. No worries. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. And in the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends. <laughs>